That. Let's get smarter tonight with the help of our leadoff panel. Elena Treen, congressional reporter for Axios, joins us. Renato Mariotti is here, former federal prosecutor and current legal affairs columnist for Politico magazine. And Kyle Spencer, journalist and author of the new book, Raising Them Right, the untold story of America's ultra-conservative youth movement and its plot for power. Renato, I turn to you first. Let's talk about the suspect accused of having additional targets beyond Paul Pelosi. Given that, can we expect additional charges beyond what he's facing with Paul? Possibly, although I have to say he is in a world of hurt already, in a difficult spot, facing state and federal charges at the same time. Uh, and frankly, I, I think that there's a potential that we're going to learn about a broader plot here. You know, one thing that I think is eerily mentioned in the federal complaint is that he was actually hoping to use Pelosi uh, and and as a way of luring another individual into his clutches. And so I think, you know, the evidence there could potentially suggest a broader conspiracy, and we can all speculate as to who that other target might be. Elena, the idea that the Capitol Police cameras caught this break-in at the Pelosi home, but nobody was actually watching them is incredible. What in the world is going on? Oh, it's totally remarkable, Stephanie. And I think... You know, it looks very badly on U.S. Capitol Police, which is already navigating a very, very tough time with what happened to Paul Pelosi and trying to assure members that they and their families are safe and that they're going to be putting in new and implementing new security measures to protect them. Uh, the U.S. Capitol Police Chief Tom Menger said today that he wants to put in place more things that ensure redundancies of protection, and, and this is exactly what happened with uh, Speaker Pelosi's house. I mean, the fact that no one was there in the Capitol who was able to see these videos from that the Washington Post, uh, very well done reporting there, that they, no one saw the footage there is incredible to me. And I think also it shows, you know, yes, when Speaker Pelosi is not in her California residence, uh, there is less security around her residence, of course, and around the speaker. And that's, I think, why obviously this was able to happen. But still, I mean, the thing that I had heard from so many members when I spoke to them in the aftermath of this attack is that if this could happen to the Speaker of the House, the woman who is third in line to the presidency, if this could happen to her, what could happen to us? We need more protections. And as the political environment has become far more polarized, far more violent in recent years, uh, it's really scary. And people are wondering whether or not there are enough protections in place to keep up with the environment as it's continuing to change and turn more violent. Kyle, you want to talk about crime in this country? Fine. Let's put that over here. But on what planet is it a political win for some Republicans to spread twisted lies and attack Paul Pelosi, an 82-year-old man who's lying in a hospital bed. Who are the voters who are saying, yep, I'm into this? It's the voters who really hate the Democrats and who really hate Pelosi. And hate humanity. And hate, hate humanity. I mean, these are people, Pelosi has been a target for Republicans, particularly young Republicans, sorry, for Democrats, particularly for, for a very long time. Pelosi is one of these women that they have targeted as part of the kind of evil left-wing empire. And so immediately, anything that happens to her, if there's an opportunity to take her down on Twitter, they're going to do it. And what you saw with this was an immediate... Uh, take down of this kind of yellow journalism rolled out little crumbs. You know, had Charlie Kirk, you had Ted Cruz, you had Dinesh D'Souza. Well, this is fishy. I don't know what's going on. They started a narrative right away to lure people into that this idea that there was something very nefarious that was happening here. Very twisted, very awful. The New York Times also is reporting that the suspect's former boss said so this guy bought the MAGA, all the conspiracy theories, hook, line, and sinker. Pizzagate, stolen election, the whole thing down the line, he bought it. Are we at the point where these sick lies and conspiracy theories are just a permanent part of American politics, which, by the way, are about to get supercharged on Twitter? I think we are at a point where those who don't want these types of lies to be spread need to figure out a better way to combat them. Which what, is? Which is really getting out the story, what really happened, and not necessarily fighting all the time the lies. I mean, what happens with these lies is that they started out, and the story about this guy quickly, quickly in the right wing, um, you know, Twitter sphere became a story about somebody who was mentally ill, somebody who the Democrats want to now, uh, you know, lock up, even though they don't want to lock anyone else. You know, the, the 
the story immediately became something that was completely fabricated and a story about the, the, how bad Democrats were. And that's just what's going to happen. And if Democrats, I think the problem that Democrats made in this particular instance was to start talking about these conspiracy theories right away and trying to refute them. And I think, yeah, I think the Democrats really needed in this instance to talk immediately about what happened. We are sad. This is horrible. This is a terrible thing for our nation. To counter the hate and the rage, to counter these crazy voters who are thinking, I'm going to jump on this horrible bandwagon where I can attack someone I don't like and their husband just got hit by a hammer in the hospital. You got, I think that what the Democrats needed to do was come in there with the, this is a tragedy. When one of us is down, we're all down. When some a, a public official or his a spouse is hurt, we are all hurt. We are a country. We are together. We are together. We are, you know, to keep, keep that message. I think a lot of us spent way too much time refuting some of the conspiracy theories, which got but, them more play. Okay, but, but we always hear the reverse in other instances, right? When Democrats ignore it, then we say, oh, well, they really screwed up. They should have attacked this head on. So they're kind of screwed either way no, in this. It's, it's, I think they can't ignore it and they can't attack it. They need to start their own narrative. They need to create their own narrative. I think that's what Democrats are really struggling with. Even with an instance like this, everybody on the Democratic side need to be, needed to be voicing the exact same thing. This is a tragedy for our country. This is a sad thing. We are behind the speaker. We are always as Americans behind our speaker. And, and, that, and that wasn't really, didn't come through as clearly as it should have and that's the it's the it's the strong counter narrative that needs to happen people shouldn't have to create a, a narrative the truth should just be the truth elena axios is now reporting on this new effort to track incidents of threats and harassment against government officials what are you finding well this report that we have is very timely obviously because of the aftermath of the attack on Paul Pelosi, but this is something that Princeton University and the Anti-Defamation League have been working on for several years now. They've been pulling together a database to track a lot of these harassments and threats toward elected officials. And what they're found, what they found is that more often than not, the stat, the stat shows more than three times women are targeted more than men. Women in Congress, uh, election workers, candidates are targeted more often. Uh, they've also found that Death threats and gun violence are the most common threats that are being made. I mean, really scary stuff here. And they're hoping that this tracker that they've pulled together can start to predict some of these patterns more frequently and be something that the public uses more, more often moving forward. It's not a surprise. Things are getting more dangerous. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Renato, let's switch gears and talk about the Supreme Court saying Lindsey Graham must testify in the Georgia investigation. Is that it? Is this thing over? No more appeals? This guy's going to have to show up? He's going to have to show up. Now, the question is, is he going to answer questions or is he going to take the fifth? I think that's really interesting. I know it's frustrating, Stephanie, but I will say I think a lot of what this was is he's been trying to run out the clock. He's been trying to show Trump that he's not doing this willingly, that he really doesn't want to be cooperative. I think that's what a lot of this is. I think he's going to answer the questions, but obviously taking the fifth this is some questions is also a possibility. Uh, Elena, the January 6th committee negotiating with Trump and his team over their subpoena. I mean, I know they're already getting testimony from some members of the Secret Service. At this point, what is left to get? Trump isn't going to show up. Even if they get stuff from the Secret Service, what is that going to turn into? Like, who is going to be held accountable? What does that look like? Right. Well, we are in this weird phase, Stephanie, where the committee is wrapping up its work. They're supposed to disband by the end of the year. So they only have so much time to wrap up their investigation and file their report. Uh, and I think the thing about Donald Trump testifying, it's just I find it so unlikely. I know that the committee does not want to give him a platform, a public platform for him to come in and spew lies spread more information and make it the Trump show. I think that's a huge fear that they have. But I also think having him testify behind closed doors and under oath, while it would be very compelling, and I think you know the committee could learn a lot from that, very unclear whether Donald Trump's lawyers would do that. I don't think it'd be a good idea for Trump's lawyers to do that. We know that he's misled people behind closed doors and lied under oath in the past. And so it seems like the subpoena is becoming more and more unlikely to be fulfilled. And they really, like I said, they just don't have a lot of time left to wrap this up. I think really the big question now is what will the Department of Justice do? All of the attention is going to very quickly turn, particularly after the midterm elections, to the Justice Department. Are they going to issue any charges, criminal charges, against 
many of these people tied to Donald Trump. Will there be any fallout and legal fallout really of this? And I think it's going to be a very, very difficult road for Attorney General Merrick Garlick to navigate once the committee wraps up their thing and the attention turns to the Department of Justice. Kyle, let's go back to talking about knocking down conspiracy theories. You know who doesn't like to do that? Elon Musk. He has now taken over Twitter, and we know what he likes to do. Talk to us about what this takeover has been like so far and what we're in for. So I think that Elon Musk is hedging his bets right now. He went in there, he told all of his right-wing followers and friends that what he was going to do was liberate them. And a lot of them then went onto Twitter and said they'd been liberated, that they were going to be able to say whatever they wanted on Twitter now. Now it's not so clear that's going to happen. Twitter already has a problem, right? Twitter has a yellow journalism problem. It is a home for people to spread disinformation, racial epithets, lots of nasty stuff. And so that is going to, that's going to continue to be a problem, I think. But I do think that corporate America, it is not in their best interest to make Twitter a worse place than it already is. And so they are, I think, at this point going to be the check for him. And I really don't think that he is going to defy them because they're going to take off. They're going to they're not going to advertise. And I think it says in some crazy instance, they may save us. Without those advertising dollars, it won't work quickly. Renato, the Treasury Department now potentially reviewing the deal. From a legal perspective, isn't it too late? The deal's closed. It's done. He and the sink showed up last week. Yeah, I don't see the deal actually being undone. I think it's interesting that they're reviewing it. Uh, it's possible that they might impose some additional requirement on the company, particularly given foreign ownership. But I don't see a world in which the government at this point is going to undo uh, Mr. Musk's takeover of Twitter. But are there conflicts of interest, especially with potential foreign investors? Sure as heck there are. Elena, Renato, Kyle, thank you so much for starting us off tonight. When we come back, the ace election.